Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Gail Carr Williams from Vanderbilt University, and on behalf of Vanderbilt University, I'd like to welcome you to our Food for Thought with the Frist Center. This is our part three of three on ink, silk, and gold, exploring the historic empires of the Islamic world through the visual arts and culture. And hard to believe we're on our third series. It's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey um, for us and our staff at Vanderbilt and also working with these amazing art professionals at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. Um, as you leave out, make certain you say a big thank you to Chandra and Carol. We wouldn't be able to do this without them. They're amazing. Chandra takes in all of your reservations and makes certain you all have lunches and helps tremendously with the programming. So. And Carol gets those name tags just right at the table so you can find them easily to be able to access this absolute wonderful program. You know, I, I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees for the Frist Center and a partner through Vanderbilt and also as a member of this Nashville community. And I can't tell you how proud I am of the Frist Center. And so I stand here very humbly today introducing this panel and the third series. Uh, what a wonderful place that would extend itself to make certain that Nashville and the greater Nashville community has the opportunity to experience art of the world. Uh, what a great place, what courage to bring this art exhibit to Nashville. Now we're, we're lucky, there's so many days that I'm happy to be a Nashvillean and this is indeed another day that I'm happy to be a Nashvillean and happy to be with a partner with the Frist Center. So Frist Center, big shout out to you guys, you rock. Susan Edwards, I don't know if you're here today, but uh, what a great director and leader for our community. With all that being said, let's get on to this uh, absolutely wonderful panel we have today. And my colleague, my friend, Megan Robertson, is going to be the moderator and introduce this panel. And Megan, it's been just a joy to get to uh, work with you the past couple of years on these Food for Thoughts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gail, and thank you to Carol and Chandra. This um, partnership with Vanderbilt's Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations um, is really one of our, our treasured partnerships, and we are so um, just thankful um, to Gail uh, for bringing this to the Frist Center. Uh, so my name is Megan Robertson, and I'm the Associate Curator of Interpretation here at the Frist Center. I am joined on the panel today to my left by my colleague here at the Center, Trinita Kennedy, who is one of our curators, and by Samira Sheikh, who is an Associate Professor of History at Vanderbilt University, and also the co-coordinator of a series on Islam, which is going to be ongoing at the Robert Penn Warren Center at Vanderbilt. So um, if you do look her up and kind of check out some of those events coming up in the near future. Thank you all for coming today. Um, this series has been focused exclusively on our exhibition, Ink, Silk, and Gold, Islamic Art in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. So in the seventh century, a new religion known as Islam was founded on the Arabian Peninsula. And from there, it spread quickly, profoundly affecting the many cultures who adopted the faith. The exhibition, Ink, Silk, and Gold, is really intended as an introduction to Islamic art. Um, it includes 94 objects that were made over the huge swath of history from the 8th century to the 21st and in a geographic area that spans from Spain to Indonesia. I think that the breadth um, of the exhibition really reveals the rich and varied histories of the many societies that make up the Islamic world and just shows how they resist easy generalizations. The exhibition also features objects that were made for both sacred and secular contexts. And so for this series, for Food for Thought, we've really been taking each panel as an opportunity to spotlight a historical period um, or specific society that's within that huge span of history and geography. And so today we're going to be looking at um, a section called the Era of Empires, which really looks at from the 16th to the 18th centuries. Um, and so we'll be exploring the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals. Trinita helpfully pointed out to me that when you go check out the exhibition after today's panel, which I certainly hope you will, these are the pink galleries. 
So though these three empires were sometimes in conflict with one another over religious differences and territorial disputes, the empires shared the use of the Persian and Arabic languages, similar forms of government centered on sacred kingship, and a cultural heritage that linked them back to the Mongol and Timurid empires. And so I'll just draw your attention to the map to the, oh, excuse me, I won't. Um, to the far west, we have the Ottoman Empire, which as you can see, really kind of spreads even into Eastern Europe, so Turkey, Austria. Um, and I'll also just point, pinpoint um, Venice, Italy here on the map because that will become relevant to our discussion later. Here in this kind of purple shade, we have the Safavid Empire. Often um, those areas were, are referred to as Persia. The Safavid dynasty lasted from 1501 to 1736 and included much of present-day Iran, Armenia, and Georgia. Then, all the way to the east, and I'm having so much trouble with my pointer, uh, we have the Mughal Empire. Um, and the Mughal Empire in South Asia included at its height nearly all of present-day India, as well as Bangladesh and Pakistan. And in our conversations while we were planning for today, um, we had a really lovely conversation. And Samira, you talked about the year 1500, 1500 as a watershed moment in world history, when global perspectives began to change. So could you tell us just a little bit about the world at that time? Uh, the world in 1500, <clears throat> the first time uh, that the whole globe was connected, um, the first time that um, diseases could, could swing all the way around the globe, um, the first time that uh, people started to know about each other all around the world. But one of the most interesting things about the part of the world that Megan has just described, the three great empires of uh, the Middle East and uh, Western Asia, was that they were propped up by gunpowder. These were the gunpowder empires. Um, and it was cannon and small arms that made them uh, the great bureaucratic uh, empires that they turned out to be. These were, um, along with the Ming in China, the greatest land empires uh, that history had seen until then. And, and you can see in this, um, this gorgeous image um, that there are a lot of guns uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Shanama painting, um, as well as in the next one. Uh, would Trinita, would you like to uh, talk about this uh, at all? <laughs> no, okay. I'll, I'll, so, so, so can, you, can you see the guns? Can you see all the... Uh, and it was, it was um, uh, the artillery that kept these empires together, that, that, um, that kept them also fighting with each other. Um, and you can see um, how they are represented in, a, in various different contexts. In this particular painting, which is from Iran, um, yeah, you see um, these sort of rifle-like... Um, like objects, and should we move to the next? Oh, I've got it. And here again, you've got um, in this beautiful uh, velvet roundel that you can see in the galleries, you've also got a, um, a, a rifle-like um, gun in this, in this gorgeous image. So yeah, so what I wanted to suggest to you is that these are, this, this part of the world, these three great empires were the center in some ways of the world at the time, and they um, they were they were held together by the force of arms, uh, once again for perhaps for the first time in history. Thank you so much, and perhaps you could just tell us too a little bit about kind of trade and globalism. You you were talking about that diseases were spreading across the world for the first time. This is a really wonderful brooch in the exhibition. So this central emerald, this very large carved emerald, um, would have been mined in South America um, and then made its way to the Mughal court where it was carved. And then in the 20th century, uh, we had the American heiress. Um, Marjorie Post have it set in this wonderful kind of Art Deco diamond um, setting, but I think it's really very indicative of this kind of trade, this moment of trade. Uh, yes, indeed. So you have um, uh, an emerald mine in uh, Colombia, probably. Uh, that that's where the the best um, emeralds were mined, brought probably by either the Spanish or the Portuguese to India. Uh, the Mughals uh, really prized. Um, 
precious stones, and they would source them from wherever they could get them. Um, and since these beautiful emeralds were coming in, they, they, um, they lost no opportunity to, um, to enjoy them um, and also to embellish them. So in this case, you have this beautifully carved image. And this was only one of the objects that was becoming an emblem of the kind of globalization that a connected world was beginning to see. Um, precious stones, um, but of course India itself, and not just India, but the three great empires were also sources of some of the most coveted trade goods anywhere in the world. Uh, and goods that were produced in, in Turkey, in Iran, and in India were uh, were, were very much prized um, elsewhere as well, in Europe, in China, um, as well as um, eventually uh, later uh, in North America as well. Um, and these included, um, in terms of um, uh, the Indian trade products, the most important was, and I always ask this in class, what, what was the most important Indian trade product? Spices, uh, but equally important was textiles. Um, so India, and there's a, there's a recent book uh, that, that actually says this, India uh, clothed the world uh, prior to 1750. About a quarter of all textile production that was used um, and produced worldwide was produced in India. Um, among the great trade uh, uh, commodities that were also circulating were porcelain, so people needed dishes to eat off or to enjoy as just beautiful objects. Chinese porcelain was the most renowned and people from all over the world wanted Chinese porcelain. But there was also porcelain industries uh, elsewhere in the world. And in this case, um, the, the pottery of Iznik in Turkey is, is extremely famous. It takes some of its palette from sort of Chinese models, but, um, but then sort of you see, you see local transformations, you see um, in both motif and technique that happen locally in different places. And you have this beautiful uh, fritware plate in the exhibition that uh, I'm sure you will enjoy seeing. This is from the early 16th century. And so before Trinita joined the Frist Center staff, she um, worked at, on an exhibition called Venice and the Islamic World at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So Trinita, maybe kind of as a case study for the kinds of larger cultural shifts um, that Samira has been discussing, could you tell us what the impact of trade between Venice, Italy and the Ottoman Empire in modern Turkey, what it was? So um, Venice is a city that we, we all know and love on the eastern coast of Italy. And um, it's built on about 118 islands, I think. And it really only has as its natural resources fish and salt. And so from the very beginning of its history, it established itself as an important trading center. And initially, its relationship was uh, primarily with the Byzantine Empire, but as Islam spread throughout the Near East, then um, Venetians became increasingly in contact with um, Muslims, and they had important trade relationships with um, the Mamluks, the Ottomans, and the Safavids in particular. And Venetians traveled quite far in order to get these spices and the um, pottery and the textiles, um, all of these wonderful things um, that Samira was just talking about. Um, they would send out ships um, into the Mediterranean and um, bring back all of these um, goods and sell them uh, to Venetians and to other Europeans. The Germans were um, resident in Venice so that they could get a piece of, of this wonderful merchandise too. And really, Venice's history wouldn't, um, it's, it's impossible to tell the history of Venice without um, talking about its relationship to the Islamic world. Um, we have a few works of art in the exhibition that um, are indicative of this relationship, um, even if only in, in a general way. Um, we do have this uh, fantastic carpet that, um, it's a Mamluk style carpet. Um, it's a very distinctive um, style with these geometric patterns and a really beautiful um, palette of, of green and blue and red. And this carpet is in wonderful condition. And it's also um, a square shape. And both of these things suggest to me that it was um, probably made for the European market. 
And um, a lot of Europeans considered um, Islamic carpets to be so valuable and precious that they wouldn't put them on the floor and walk on them. They would actually display them on their tables. And so this square shape is, is perfect for a table. And um, the fact that this, this carpet is in such good condition really um, indicates that it was probably in Europe. And I'm showing you on uh, the right a portrait of a Venetian family gathered around um, a, an Ottoman carpet. And you can see that, um, that really they consider this an important part of their identity, that they had these goods from the East. And they also even have a really beautiful uh, porcelain blue and white bowl, um, which may come from China or it may come from, uh, from Iznik. Um, it may be an Iznik bowl. And the Venetians um, very much needed um, to trade with the Islamic world. Um, actually, the Islamic world didn't need Venice as much as Venice needed them. And um, the Venetians uh, created products that were suited specifically for a, a Muslim consumer. So they made mosque lamps, for example. Um, particularly in the 16th century, Venice um, produced a lot of glass for the Islamic world. Um, we have a really wonderful um, mosque lamp in our exhibition that was made in Syria in the 14th century. But it's really in the 15th and 16th century that um, the center for glass making um, in the world becomes Venice. Um, this is when um, it really gains in significance, and the island of Murano becomes an important glass-making center. Um, but this mosque lamp here was probably made for a, a mosque in the Ottoman world, but produced in Murano in Venice. And on the right, um, again, we see the Venetians trying to, um, to capture a little bit of the uh, of the Ottoman market. Um, they produced a printed um, Quran in the 16th century, um, probably the first printed Quran. Um, two Venetian uh, publishers um, produced this book and they hoped that it would be a bestseller. But actually, um, the, it was instead a, a big flop because um, calligraphy was um, uh, considered to be the ideal um, way of producing uh, a handwritten uh, Quran was um, prized more than a printed one. And so the Venetians weren't successful at all in this particular um, enterprise. And printed Qurans didn't become common until the 19th century. So one of the um, most important episodes in artistic exchange between uh, Venice and the Islamic world comes in 1479 when the Venetian painter Gentile Bellini travels to Istanbul um, at the request of the Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II. And uh, Mehmet II is known for having conquered uh, Constantinople in 1453. Um, he was only 21 years old when he did so. And um, beginning in 1463, the Ottomans and the Venetians um, were at war with one another. And when they finally um, declared peace, uh, I think 16 years later, something like that, they, um, Mehmet II uh, requested that a good Venetian painter come and work for him for a few years. So Gentile Bellini actually um, traveled all the way to Istanbul and lived um, at the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, which was newly built at the time. And he spent two years um, uh, living there. Um, probably the most famous work of art to come out of this uh, visit is the painting on the right, now in the National Gallery in London, um, painted in 1480, which is just a few months um, before Mehmet II's death. And the painting is really uh, uh, a fascinating uh, portrait of this Ottoman ruler. He is shown in um, three-quarter profile um, beneath an archway, um, probably a triumphal archway. And there are some inscriptions. Um, the painting is actually not in, in great condition anymore, but the inscriptions tell us the precise day when the portrait was finished, which was November 25th, 1480. And then there's an inscription that calls Mehmet Victor Orbis, um, conqueror of the world. 
Um, we see the uh, Ottoman Sultan with a really beautiful fur um, mantle and this beautiful, uh, beautifully wrapped turban. Um, and this is the turban of a scholar. So Mehmet II wanted to be represented that way. And um, he has this uh, red Taj at the top. I think actually uh, the headgear that you see in a lot of these paintings is really fascinating. Um, and this portrait, it kind of, um, the iconography that's developed um, in this portrait, it, it kind of reverberates through um, portraiture in the Islamic world for a very long time. And um, we see a few examples here in our exhibition. Um, this uh, Persian uh, portrait of a nobleman here is um, in our galleries right now. And um, in this case, uh, we see he's probably kind of a, a petty military commander, um, but he's represented in a way that kind of echoes um, the uh, facial features of Mehmet II. I thought that was very striking. Um, and he wears a, a very similar turban. Um, and we know that this is an important man because he um, holds a golden cup and he's waiting for a servant to come uh, fill it up for him. Um, so that's a sign of his uh, status, among other things. Um, and we see some of his um, uh, military uh, instruments here, so a bow and arrow and a mace. Um, so he, he combines um, some of the elements of the portraiture of Mehmet II into uh, a, a Safavid environment. Um, he's shown at full length, actually, rather than half length. And I also thought it was interesting that um, the, the Mughal emperor, um, Jahangir, when he is portrayed in a portrait in the early 17th century, that he also has um, this lovely um, brocade on a parapet before him. Um, so uh, this episode between uh, Venice and the Islamic world is kind of a, a landmark in, in Islamic art. So Samira, you mentioned just very briefly some of the textiles and their importance um, kind of to the, the Mughal economy. But um, so the exhibition is really full of beautiful textiles. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about why they were um, kind of important within their own culture, but also appealing to a Western market. OK. A list of words. Kashmir, seersucker, chintz, calico, Madras, muslin, paisley, and last but not least, pajamas. <laughs> These are all words that come from Indian languages and are textiles, fabrics, or items of clothing, and they've become very common in, in the English language since the late 17th century. And I think that just indicates uh, beautifully the importance that um, Eastern fabrics, in particular Indian ones, um, had uh, for the Western market. Um, so why did, why did Westerners want all these Indian fabrics? Why didn't they just make them themselves? Um, I mean, look at this. These, were, uh, these are men's sashes that would be worn around, uh, tied around your waist if you were um, a courtier of, you know, a certain standing. They, uh, the, both the, the ones that we have in the exhibition here are, are made of silk, uh, beautifully hand-woven, very uh, just exquisite um, uh, detail, workmanship, uh, design. Um, so Indian, Indian weavers basically could produce anything for any market. Um, Indian weavers were producing, as I said before, 25% of the textile production of the world up to about the years 1750, which is when the British came along and within 50 years basically destroyed the Indian weaving industry. By the year 1900, India produced only 2% of the textiles in the world. So that, that was a dramatic um, drop in about 150 years. Um, Indian weavers were also very uh, sensitive to demand, as I've said. So every year, uh, different markets. So in Indonesia, if people wanted to, um, you know, beautiful Indian fabrics, they would say, well, Paisley is not in fashion this year. Could you send us animal prints or, 
you know, geometric prints, and the Indian weavers would oblige. Um, so here you've got um, um, these uh, rather lovely portraits of um, two Indian courtiers, and you can see the kind of uh, fabrics that they are dressed in. And these would be expensive fabrics that would be available to the elite, but also in many cases to a more, uh, to a wider um, um, uh, uh, market as well. Um, it's interesting to note that um, muslin was often a very desirable fabric. Uh, so both the gentlemen you see here in this are wearing the finest muslin, and muslin uh, that's so fine as to be sort of see-through. Uh, in some portraits, you can even see the artist showing um, a man's body hair. Um, uh, very, very carefully painted, and that gives you an indication of how fine the muslin is and how, how expensive it therefore is. Uh, both gentlemen um, have uh, beautiful sashes around their waists, and they are like the ones you can see in the exhibition. Uh, they're both also wearing pajamas. Um, so, uh, and again, those would often be of the most beautiful fabrics. Uh, and again, headgear is important. Headgear often indicated your community, your status, your rank, and could tell the, 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 the observer a lot about um, the person who was either being depicted or was before you, as the case might be. Um, and in this particular painting on the right, oops, unfortunately, we don't have it in this exhibition, but there are... Uh, so the courtier is depicted with various attendants who would normally um, have accompanied him. And you can see sort of their outfits too, which are elaborately displayed. Um. Oh. <laughs> well, and so we'll, we'll move into kind of our, our next section. And I think that those, it is, it's amazing to think about, I think, how um, Indian textiles have shaped kind of the, the grammar of dress and our preferences and comfort. Um, and so we've been talking kind of within this first section a lot about goods traveling from country to country. And Trinita alluded to this idea that, that artists and people are moving as well. Um, and I wondered if Samira could share a little bit of kind of, again, a case study, a particular instance. Um, this time, the Mughal Emperor Akbar's um, assembly of his ateliers, so his artist workshops. So Samira, can you tell us a bit, a bit about what he was doing and who was coming? Okay. Now, um, one of the things it's, uh, that is interesting to think about is that most of the objects that you will see in the exhibition around the corner, most of the paintings at least, are very small. Um, many of them were bound into books uh, or were individual folios, but they were meant to be held in your hand. They were an intimate experience. A rich uh, patron would not necessarily in the Western style commission a painting to be hung on the wall. Uh, they would, uh, but uh, instead they would commission these beautiful small objects that could be treasured, that could be uh, enjoyed privately. The object you see here on the screen, however, is very large. And this is not a painting, but a carpet. And once again, it was a carpet that wasn't necessarily meant to be walked upon. It was meant to be hung on the wall. So instead of hanging paintings on the wall um, in these empires, you often had people uh, hanging uh, beautiful, elaborately woven carpets on the wall. In this case, this gorgeous Mughal carpet, which is probably from the late 15th century, which is a very early carpet in terms of um, uh, survival, um, is, uh, has sort of vignettes from hunting scenes. So here you have, um, and the Mughals loved hunting. It was one of their favorite things to do, favorite pastimes. Uh, and they would often hunt with cheetahs. Uh, one of the most, one of the fastest animals, and the cheetahs were trained to corral the animal that was being hunted, um, and um, sometimes cheetahs would even be used for tiger hunts. So you have the imperial cheetah being transported on a little uh, bullock cart here, and taken to the hunt, and the cheetah is ready to spring. Um, so that's rather lovely. Um, here you've got a sort of fairly domestic scene with you know, domestic events happening. These people don't seem to be concerned very much with the hunt. You've got a little Hindu temple here. Um, and you've got here, down here, a more sort of fantastic um, 
mythical animal that uh, I, I don't know whether you can actually see, but it has grabbed a bunch of elephants in its various talons and um, uh, is, is throwing around elephants. So you've moved from, from a sort of domestic register to a royal register where there's a royal hunt, and down here is the more sort of fantastic register in which you know, crazy things are happening that you only think about in your dreams. Um, now, how were these wonderful objects put together and how were they, um, they created? Uh, the Mughals, the Ottomans, the Safavids all became um, consumers or, and patrons of artists from that entire zone. Um, Akbar, uh, who was the third Mughal emperor, lived in the second half of the um, 16th century, was a particularly uh, enthusiastic patron of the arts. Um, and um, he would often, he, he assembled a, a, a workshop of hundreds of artists. So people from Iran, Turkey, and all over India would come and work for him. Now again, it's uh, a thing to remember is that although these were all Muslim kings, they didn't only rule Muslims. They had um, Hindus, Christians, Jews amongst their subjects. And certainly, um, Akbar was one of those kings who was very enthusiastic about the the skills and uh, abilities of Hindu artists. Um, he also was very interested in European artists and, and um, um, very influenced by them, but uh, about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, here you have one of Akbar's um, earliest commissions where he asked uh, a group of probably at least 30 artists to create a set of uh, paintings for him that depicted the adventures uh, of, um, of a hero from the earliest days of Islam, an, uh, a figure called Hamza, who is uh, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. And he's believed to have had these sort of fantastical adventures, some of which are, you know, stretch your imagination a little. They are dragons and giants and all sorts of exciting happenings. But it's interesting to think that Akbar commissioned these paintings to be made when he was 14 years old. They took 20 years to finish, but um, but uh, you can sort of see the imagination of a young boy uh, getting his favorite sort of stories, his favorite comic book characters illustrated um, in this great imperial venture. So 1,400 paintings were produced to illustrate the adventures of Hamza. Um, only 200 survive. And we're lucky to, have, um, to be able to see one of them in the exhibition here. Um, unlike uh, many of the paintings you will see, this one is a little bit bigger, so it's about um, 27 inches by 21 inches. This particular episode depicts a, um, um, a fisherman named Iskandar uh, who's minding his own business fishing. There's his fishing net. Um, when a little baby wrapped in a bundle um, sort of washed up against the shore, um, and this is what the story says. When he opened the bundle, he saw that it was a crying babe. His heart melted. He kissed the child with love and affection, took it into his arms, and adopted his, it as his own, giving it the name of his own father, the Rab. And the child that was discovered was the son of the hero, Hamza. So we've got that. We've got to that point in the story. Uh, so the story of a mythical Muslim hero, but the painting is painted by a Hindu. Uh, and has certainly themes that would resonate with Christian viewers as well. I mean, just think of babies being discovered. Um, but uh, for a Hindu artist, he also puts in uh, his frame a Hindu temple and a very, very Indian landscape, which includes cows going home at dusk. So you've got, uh, you know, the story of a mythical Muslim hero depicted in a very Indian, very intimate, very tender style in this particular uh, folio made for a Muslim emperor. Uh, this is not in the exhibition, but this is also from the Hamza Nama and is at the Museum of Fine Arts. And this is a little different. I just wanted to show you the contrast. This is a little more comic book style. Um, and this depicts a, um, a man who's sort of falling down from, he's maybe being pushed off a parapet here. Here's a hero coming in. Um, to do, yeah, some event, 
and, and there's, there's clearly some event here. It's not quite clear what's going on, but it's, 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 it's painted quite differently and with a different sort of tone to it. Um, uh, are we ready for... Sure. So, um, so I, th I think that the Hamza Nama folio is really a, a not to be missed object within the ink, silk, and gold. It's it's very large. While many of the miniature paintings are truly miniature, it's a stretch to call this one um, miniature. And it is it is delightful to see kind of the many hands that came together to make these works of art and Akbar's ateliers. Um, this is this is another object that is in our section exploring Mughal India. And Trinita, could you tell us just a little bit about it, um, and particularly a little bit about kind of um, European influence within it since this is your area. Sure. Um, may I have the oh. pointer, please? Absolutely. So this is um, a work of art that is about 13 inches high, so a little more than a foot, and about 18 inches wide, so quite small. And yet the artist is able to incorporate 68 figures plus um, down below um, an elephant for good measure and also um, a horse. And um, this is actually an extremely important um, Mughal painting. It gives us insight into court life um, during the reign of Jahangir, who was the eldest surviving son of Akbar. And Jahangir ruled the Mughal Empire from 1605 until 1627. And um, every day at 4 o'clock, he would um, organize these... Um, Dar bars, which are um, kind of uh, ceremonial courts, and um, everyone would gather, and he would stand um, in in the best position. Of course, um, this this painting really tells us about um, who's the most important <laughs> um, at the Mughal court. So here is Jahangir, um, right in the center and at the highest point. And um, he stands below a canopy. He's actually been kind enough to erect this canopy so the um, sun um, doesn't blaze on the crowd. And um, actually, it's really the jewels in the, um, the, that certain figures wear that tell us um, who is the most important. So of course, Jahangir himself has on an exquisite um, necklace that's made out of rubies and emeralds and diamonds and pearls and all kinds of wonderful things. He's also got beautiful rings on. I, I highly recommend that you um, peer into this image after our, our talk today. And then um, his family members are also wearing really beautiful jewelry. So um, this man right here is um, his eldest son who would rule um, after him as Shah Jahan. And then uh, this, this little boy here is um, uh, Jahangir's grandson. And it's actually um, one of the ways we date this painting is by estimating how old this little boy is. He's probably about four or five. And then down below on this beautiful blue carpet, we can see another one of Jahangir's sons, um, his, um, I believe, his second oldest son. Um, and they're the ones who really have um, the most important position within the painting. Now, at this time, there were a lot of um, Europeans visiting India, and um, a lot of European prints and paintings were, um, were arriving, and uh, local artists were studying them and looking at um, uh, things like uh, the recession of space. So actually, we have three very clear zones here. Um, down below, sorry, I'm having trouble. Um, this is obviously the foreground, and then we have the middle ground without beautiful carpet, and then up above this kind of balcony for the most important uh, members of the court. Um, we also have a very fascinating detail here at the uh, in the frieze above Jahangir. There's a depiction of the Virgin Mary. And um, the Mughals were so fascinated by this European art, which was primarily religious because it was being brought by missionaries, um, that actually the Mughals had their palaces and tombs um, decorated with frescoes, uh, with depictions of, of Christian saints and uh, the Virgin and Christ. And um, we actually get to see one of those details um, here in this painting. 
And I know actually that um, Sumira, you would like to talk a little bit about um, these missionaries a little bit more, right? The Jesuits who were such an important presence in India at the time. Uh, so the Jesuits came to India um, at the time of Akbar's, uh, of Jahangir's father, Akbar, uh, who was very well known as somebody who um, welcomed religious debate. So he invited Jesuit priests to his court, debated with them. Uh, the Jesuits thought for a while that they might be able to convert him. They, they were hopeful, <laughs> but it didn't, didn't sort of work out. Um, but Jahangir was also interested in, um, in the Jesuits, and um, you see here um, uh, Father uh, Geronimo Xavier, uh, there he is, um, who was a, actually quite a prominent figure at Jahangir's court, and in fact wrote a little uh, book in, per in, in Portuguese about uh, the court, about Jahangir's court and his experiences there. So you've got him and um, you've also, it's, um, if you have very good eyesight or a magnifying glass, you will be able to see that each person in this portrait is actually identified. Uh, there's a little Persian inscription, usually in their headgear or somewhere, but all the people that are in this painting are actually named, we know their names. Um, so that's also remarkable and it shows you how uh, carefully and um, how sort of intimately these, these court portraits were made um, to give you a sense, give, give the emperor a sense of who he ruled, but also give um, whoever was privileged to see these paintings a sense of how the court was constructed. So you've got, as Trunita said, uh, the hierarchy all the way from uh, the emperor and his close relatives to, uh, to hierarchy of court, uh, courtiers and officials. The further you are away from the emperor, the lower in status you are. And down here you've got the elephant handler and the groom. And down here is a little inscription which is by the artist himself. And he calls himself the lowest of the low servants of the emperor. So he's, he's inscribed himself in as well. Well, I think that all of these images that we've been look at, looking at call up a few really interesting kind of points and might um, be an opportunity to clear up some misconceptions about Islamic art. Um, so first of all, um, it's, I, I've encountered many guests who have kind of noted that they were surprised by the number of human figures that they were seeing in the exhibition. Would either of you ladies like to, to talk to us a little bit about, uh, about that kind of preference and then maybe especially about an Akbar's court? Um. So most of the three great Semitic religions um, have interpretations that would prohibit the creation of, of human figures. Uh, Akbar was certainly very aware of that prohibition within Islam, uh, but he decided to ignore it. He loved art. He loved the depiction of both human and animal figures, and he had no time for those who uh, were bigoted enough not to enjoy that, that experience. Um, so I'm going to read out to you one of his remarks on the art of painting um, that was recorded by one of his followers. He said, bigoted followers of the letter of the law are hostile to the art of painting, but such men I dislike. It appears to me as if a painter had quite peculiar means of recognizing God. For a painter, in sketching anything that has life and in, and in devising its limbs one after another must come to feel that he cannot bestow individuality upon his work and is thus forced to think of God, the giver of life, and will thus increase in knowledge. Yeah, how wonderful, right? So in painting, you recognize the limitations of what you can create and you're forced to think about God who is the, the, the true creator, right? So he goes against the bigots at his own court and within his own um, sort of circle in terms of sort of justifying this expression as actually a means of, of expressing devotion. Um, so certainly uh, that was a tendency that Akbar had and his descendants very much continued and continues to remain in the sensibility of all the three great um, um, the three great empires we've been talking about, that sensibility that art is something to be enjoyed, um, that it's, it can be devotional, it can be intoxicating, it can be beautiful, and it's not 
it's not against religion at all. Trinita, did you have anything to add? Well, I think that it's always important to note that when we see figures in Islamic art, it's almost always in secular contexts. Um, and this is a very good example here that we have on the screen. This is essentially history painting. Um, and this isn't something that was intended for a mosque. That's right. And so you definitely will kind of see that division of different kind of contexts informing what is appropriate. Um, and and that, that kind of tolerance towards figurative imagery does also change over time. So while Akbar welcomes it, um, other um, sultans or shahs and other courts may not have felt um, um, as confident um, in their kind of relationship to the arts. I also will just point out, too, in this, in this that this is one of the really wonderful examples of portraiture, that these are distinctive individuals. The Hamza Nama had these great figures who are types. They're heroes, they're princesses, they're villains, um, but uh, these bear really close scrutiny because there is different kind of individual physiognomy happening here. Uh, but another thing that we've kind of talked about um, internally and with our partners and towards that most of these objects were truly made for kind of an elite audience, an elite circle. Um, and I wondered um, if we might talk a little bit about where does the everyday kind of man and woman fit in, um, or the artist's conception of themselves within this kind of elite royal court circle. Spear, do you have anything to add on that? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, I think most of the objects that you will see in the exhibition are from this courtly context. That's very much true. And, and I would agree with Trinita in saying that um, the court, in that sense, is secular, right? It's about where the kings are, where the courtiers are. So what's produced for them is not necessarily what's produced for God. But on the other hand, uh, I think um, there is also not quite as clear a division between what is religious and what is secular within these courts. So as, as I suggested, Akbar himself thought of the art of painting as an act of, of religion. Um, and also, uh, the, the, act of, the, the act of painting, of depicting humans, was also a way of experiencing their humanity, of, of, uh, of recognizing pain, of recognizing experiences that are common to all humans, regardless of what station they have. And that was, again, seen as, in, in some registers, as a, as a, as, as a religious experience. Um, in this case, there's this wonderful uh, drawing um, of uh, a tiger attacking a young boy who was from a humble background. I believe he's supposed to be a grocer's son. And uh, we get a sort of vivid sense of the terror and, and you know, the, the, the absolute sort of um, horror of that scene um, from the perspective of an observer. And it, it's clear that in this case, the painter actually witnessed this scene, was very moved by it, and was um, decided to depict it. Um, <clears throat> we haven't, there is another uh, wonderful Mughal paint, uh, Mughal drawing in this case, uh, which is in this exhibition, but didn't unfortunately travel to Nashville. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I thought I'd show it to you because it's, uh, it's part of um, uh, the way the exhibition was originally conceived. And that is a painting that was commissioned by Jahangir. Um, uh, uh, which, 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 uh, which is a depiction of the death of one of his courtiers, uh, who was an opium addict. Um, and he had this man who was dying, basically carried into his court, and he invited his court artist to paint him. It was partly a way of actually scientifically observing how death happens and how addiction can, you know, ravage the body. But it was also a deeply sort of human endeavor to show to people that, you know, Bad things happen when you, when you have too much opium. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and Jahangir himself was a prodigious drinker, a prodigious op opium consumer himself. So it was perhaps a lesson to himself as well. And I love this drawing because it's, um, it somehow shows something of the fragility of life. You see this man sort of shrunken, his ribs showing, his, his, he's on the point of death. Um, you see him sort of surrounded by these cushions that are bigger than him. 
he's, he's shrunk to such, such, a, such an extent. And there's, a, um, there's another version of this that's in Oxford that, that's a more sort of complete version with color in it. And to, to me, the, the cushion behind him that's, that's painted in this dark color is a foreboding one, that death is about to come and take over um, his life. So I think you can get, get a sense of sort of common human themes within these paintings as well as very elite and very courtly themes. And I, I thought I would like to convey that to you. Thank you. Yes, I think that all of this is just helping, we hope, to, to kind of nuance our understanding of Islamic art. And that's really one of our, our hopes with this exhibition and the, the lecture series as well. Um, and so, you know, we really feel that by getting to know these works of art, we can begin to recognize the diversity of cultural traditions that characterize really these different geographic areas and historical periods. Um, Trinita, as we were preparing to kind of to present this exhibition to Nashville and even within our own staff, um, Trinita gave us a number of really lovely kind of introductory presentations. And this miniature painting was always in her, her kind of slideshow. So could you tell us a little bit about why it was so appealing? Sure. Um, this again is a tiny painting. It's about half the size of um, the Darbar of John Gear. And um, it's actually just a fragment of, of the original painting, but it shows a scholar in the garden. And I think what amazes me every time I see this is that the artist has um, somehow captured um, thinking, a, a man in thought, which, which isn't easy, of course. And um, so the, this is an, an older gentleman with a long beard, and he's kind of grabbing at his beard as he's um, lost in thought. And he's wearing a, a turban that we now recognize from our, our portrait of Mehmet II. This is the turban of a scholar, um, beautifully wrapped with that red Taj on top. And um, he's in uh, an ideal setting um, with these beautiful um, plants. Um, there are these um, uh, plum trees that are ablaze in the back. And I know that this is a, a Joseph Joseph's coat is what you call this plant. And there's others that I'm sure if you know more about botany than I do, um, you'd be able to identify. Um, but the, a, a garden in Islamic art is really um, a, a slice of paradise. And um, this particular scholar has beautiful um, instruments um, to do his work. So here he is um, holding a book in his hand, and it's um, a beautifully uh, leather-bound book that's embossed. Um, this little red thing is a portfolio for his papers. Um, this is a pen box. Um, this is a really beautiful little um, ink jar. And um, when you're in the galleries, you can see that it's ornamented with, um, with blue flowers. So it's that blue and white um, porcelain that we've seen already. Um, and then there are the, th the instruments for drinking. So there's a beautiful golden goblet. Um, this is a wine flask that has, it's seated on a, um, a little gold stand. And then we have what's known as a pilgrim's flask, um, which is kind of like a canteen, but a very elegant version of a canteen. And this is for water. And it looks to me like this one is made out of bronze and it takes a very um, beautiful form. Um, another thing that really surprises me about this painting every single time I see it is the, the kind of very limited palette that the artist works with. So very strong greens and browns and blues, and then color is used um, for just very select, um, select objects. But this, this one little um, painting in, in kind of five inches um, captures the theme of ink, silk, and gold, right? So we have um, the scholar with his, his little ink pot, and he perhaps is wearing silk. The um, garments look very um, smooth and silky. And um, some of his, his objects are made out of gold. So this, this painting really, um, I think, captures the theme of the exhibition. Well, I think that in our discussion as we were preparing, um, this painting also, at first glance, doesn't really seem to have anything to do with religion. But so often with objects from the distant past, you know, that first glance doesn't tell us everything. Um, Samira, you made some really lovely points. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what the painting tells us about Islam and in the Age of Empires? Um, 
So we don't know what this scholar is reading. He doesn't tell us. It could well be a religious book. It could well be a book of poetry. It could be stories. It could be a book of paintings that he's going to open and contemplate, um, just like um, you know, some of our royal patrons have been doing. Um, and in that, um, I think, I think one, one of the wonderful things about these paintings that you will see is the possibility they allow for the viewer to enter and to sort of think about the world that they inhabit. Um, it's a world that might seem strange, but once you get used to the minuteness and the scale and the colors and the perspectives, I think it's a, it's a world that invites you in and asks you to join in. So here you can sort of join the, the scholar in the garden as he enjoys the book um, that he's reading in solitude and enjoy also the fact that um, he's got these these delightful objects and, um, and intoxicating liquids around him, right? So what is, what is, what is the role of intoxication? Isn't wine, isn't, isn't, um, um, isn't intoxication forbidden for Muslims? Wouldn't a good scholar say, don't bring wine anywhere near me? Mm -hmm. Um, and here perhaps we uh, could talk for a mo moment about this p wonderful painting, which was probably made, and the, this, the catalog entry says Iran or Deccan. Deccan is South India. I'm, I would think it's probably Iran. Uh, but, um, but it's a painting about a bunch of dervishes. So these are Sufi mystics, ascetics. These are, these are guys who have dedicated themselves to uh, to following religion, to following Islam, but to following it not just in the letter of the law, but following it as experience, as love, becoming intoxicated with the love of God. And for many Sufi traditions, intoxication is a theme that is considered important to try and understand what it is to know God, to be, to love God. Uh, but just as there is a huge variety within Christianity in the ways people sort of uh, object to certain kinds of practices or in insist on certain kind of observances, and similarly, uh, there is that diversity within Islam. Um, so you will certainly have a puritanical tradition that says opium is bad, uh, wine is completely not to be thought of. On the other hand, you will have Muslims who very much enjoy these, um, these substances and in fact even think of them as ways uh, for religious expression. And you will see um, some of these Sufi mystics in the, uh, the empires that we've been discussing uh, who certainly take, uh, take the view that the easiest way to get intoxicated is by having a drink. <laughs> um. Well, so we, we have only just a few moments. I think we maybe have time for perhaps a question or two, um, depending on the length of the question. And so I'm seeing our volunteers making their way up to the microphones. But if you have any questions um, for our panelists, and I'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank Trinita and Samira um, so much for all their work. Do we have any questions out there? I see one right here in the front. <laughs> I'm wondering why women aren't depicted in the art. The only woman that I remember seeing was the Virgin Mary. So the question that was asked was, why are we not seeing depictions of women? So today, none of our examples featured any women. Would either of you like to respond, or Trinita, perhaps? You about the exhibition specifically? Because I know that there are women in there. <laughs> Actually, I am I'm kind of racking my brain for an example in our exhibition. It's, um, it is less common to see women in Islamic art. However, you do find it. I, it just so happens that our exhibition doesn't include an example that I can think of. There, there are some folios um, that, um, so there are some paintings. So there are some wonderful, um, there's one by an artist named Bizad, I think, or it's a poetry from the poet Bizad, but it's um, a Timurid era. He was an artist. 
I'm messing everything up. There's a small, um, there is a small painting of a pair of lovers, actually, of a man and a woman oh, that's true. underneath that's true. a um, kind of a flowering branch. Um, we also, in terms of the the Sufi mysticism, have an example of of a woman on a burning funeral pyre in a small um, <laughs> folio. So. Um, they are not absent, and they, they would have been in the Hamza Nama, um, Hamza's wives, um, maidservants, women that, that he encountered are there. Um, however, I, I do think that perhaps there is kind of a male-centric worldview happening here. I, I, I just add that, yes, all three traditions have thousands of women depicted within them. Um, I didn't put the exhibition together, uh, but uh, but uh, so I'm I'm actually rather surprised. You're 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 right. I hadn't noticed that there aren't any women, but uh, certainly all traditions do depict women. Uh, one um, rather lovely drawing you might be interested in spending some time on is um, an Iranian painting of a young boy, and for a long time it was thought that this was a portrait of a young woman, um, because there is a certain interest in, a, in, 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 in androgyny. So a beauty can be male or female, and sometimes the lines are a little bit blurred. Uh, so now uh, art historians think it's, it's almost definitely a young boy, uh, but um, he could also be a girl. Uh, and certainly, yeah, there's no shortage of women in these paintings. It's just the way this particular presentation, perhaps the exhibition, were put together. Now, I'm so sorry, but we have, in fact, run out of time. But that was a great question. <laughs> thank you all for coming today. Um, thank you to Vanderbilt and all of our exhibition sponsors.